United Nations peace airplane has just landed. Count Bernadotte arrives from Palestine in order to preside over the 17th International Red Cross Conference in Stockholm. Awaited by Colonel Ridman, Mr. de Rouget, Mr. Sandstrom and Dr. de Pache. And here is Countess Estelle, she greets Mr. Sandstrom, Vice Chairman of the Swedish Red Cross. Mr. de Rouget is the Secretary General of the League. Colonel Ridman of the Swedish Red Cross and Dr. de Pache, Secretary General of the Standing Commission of the Conference. It doesn't occur every day that so many people gather outside as well as inside the airport and that anyone is received with such attention that Falke Bernadotte's mission has been successful and he is eagerly expected in Stockholm. Don't miss a minute of it, brother. In the customs hall, the private secretary, Ms. Vessel, and Dr. Stavropoulos, the UN delegate, and many others surround the Count, who now and then glances at his sons, and his charming wife. Henrik Baer, the Secretary General of the Conference, is glad to find his chief in so good form. Newspaper reporters flock around Falke Bernadotte, who, in his capacity of UN mediator, gives information on the situation in Palestine. Bertil's question seems harder to answer. We will draw discreetly from the conversation between father and son and take a look instead at the Congress city itself, town of many islands and bridges. The town hall, beautifully situated on Lake Mellart, will be the seat of a great festivity. The dramatic theater in the center of the town stands also on the water, this time an inlet of the Baltic Sea. From here many boats sail out to the great archipelago. Here is a beautiful view of one island from another, where the noble architecture of the royal palace dominates the sea. Here St. George is struggling with the dragon, on a square in the oldest part of the town, where a labyrinth of alleys and buildings dating from the 17th century cluster around the castle. This is a road that not a few people of importance took to enter the parliament from the back door. Seen from the castle, the parliament lies surrounded by flags of all nations. The colorful parade lines the route from the foreign office to the royal opera. Stockholm is a popular town for conferences not least because of its favorable communications. If we cast a glance inside the parliament, we see that final preparations are being hurriedly performed. Hundreds of placards have been designed for the guidance of the delegates. Each floor has its own color. Numbers and arrows indicate the way to particular rooms. The great entrance hall resounds to the wild beat of the hammer, but still it is not quite clear what is afoot. A lot of wood went to the construction of the feet for the notices, since it is of course forbidden, strictly forbidden, to nail them up here. The decorations are now in place. They will be the first thing to catch the visitor's eye. On the left, the placard of the League of Red Cross Societies. On the right, that of the International Red Cross Committee.
Even here, the last touches are being applied by Mr. van der Mühl, Committee Chief of Information. This exhibition is arranged by him and Mr. Sigaris, the League's Chief of Information and Publications. All round the hall, long rows of pigeonholes contain the delegates' letters and papers. This is a small but colorful selection of the countries from which delegates are expected. Miss Lindbergh poses with the flags of the Eastern European countries which in the last minute refused to participate. This was disappointing. Anyhow, the transport staff will be fully occupied in meeting those who are coming. One of the first to arrive is the President of the American Red Cross and the League of Red Cross Societies, Mr. Basil O'Connor, in the midst of his collaborators. He is followed by the American delegate to Europe, Mr. Gower, and he is welcomed by Mr. Baer. It seems as they haven't seen each other for a long, long time. And in this spirit of friendship, the conference will now begin in earnest. From now on, the Parliament Square will be the scene of lively activity. One after another, the delegates arrive. The transport staff is always ready to drive the delegates wherever they wish to go. These two Danish officers have some important business to do in town. Here comes Dr. Peel, President of the South African Red Cross Society. He is greeted with a regal salute from the Parliament veteran. And now we follow the delegates into the Parliament. reception staff is fully occupied. Ms. Verkamer from Belgium collects the material which is ready for every delegate on arrival. briefcase with various programs, guidebooks, and a conference pen. Finally, the conference badge, which obviously meets with Ms. Verkamer's full satisfaction. Important detail is a collection of ration cards. Prince Kityakar of Siam and Mr. Palastira tries a conference special brand of cigarettes. The prince is evidently not only a great 16mm cameraman, but also a great smoker. But where are all these people going to live? And how can the addresses and telephone numbers of all the delegates be found? All these details are taken care of at the hotel counter. Madame Elvarez from Venezuela can be sure that Major Ospring, who is in charge, will try to do his very best in a difficult situation.
Poring over his papers, we come upon Ali Rana Taram, president of the Turkish Red Crescent. The conference bank is not very big, but has all its work cut out to change the currency of 60 nations. Colonel Blanco and Mrs. Bianco from Uruguay are just taking advantage of these facilities. Miss Peking Sale, Australia, is apparently a diligent letter writer. And she's not the only one at this conference. Here is a rarity for philatelists. The conference own stamp with the first date cover. One day later, the first important meeting, the meeting of the Executive Committee of the League, is launched, presided over by Mr. Connor. Here is Mr. Milson, Under Secretary General of the League. And here is Monsieur Del Bovier from the League. Among the public, Mr. Nicholson of the American Red Cross. With a desperate Mr. De Rougie, the Secretary General, Without and Madame Nicola, one of the most skillful stenotypists in the world. Stronger, more capable than he ever takes down before. the speeches word for word. Responsibility walks hand in hand with capacity and power. We should merit the censure of mankind. While Dr. Routley, National Commissioner of Canadian Red Cross, listens attentively. It looks easy, but it demands years of training. To some of the observations of Let us leave the meeting to see what kind of work the hosts are doing. Mr. Henrik Baer is the Secretary General of the Conference. It is he who bears the responsibility that everything proceeds in order. Every morning at 9 o'clock, the Swedish delegates meet under the leadership of Mrs. Tiselius. From the left, Baron Schanstedt, Dr. Edin, Dr. Westermark. Mrs. Tiselius is the second vice president of the Swedish Red Cross. Here is Mr. Rickard and Mrs. Steinbeck. And the former prime minister, Governor Rickard Sandler, the government's chief delegate. The first from the right is... Colonel Ridman, head of finance division. Like everything else, a conference costs money and not a little if one has a staff composed of hundreds and hundreds of Swedes and partners. The salaries are being paid out. The entertainment office is in charge of Major General Bratt, to the left, who has received a visit from the court master of ceremonies. The two gentlemen are discussing a reception to be given by His Majesty the King of Sweden. Last minute preparations are made here and in all the other departments before the conference opens. At the Royal Opera, where the ceremony is held now, when all preparatory meetings are over. The house is full to capacity, in addition to the 450 delegates from about 60 participating nations. The diplomatic corps and the representatives of the Swedish government are also present. The principal guest of honor is the former president of the Swedish Red Cross, Prince Karl, who now takes his seat with his family. <laughs> On the dais are the president of the International Red Cross Committee, Mr. Ruger, Count Bernadotte and Mr. Bezier O'Connor. Highnesses, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely grateful to you, 
Ladies and gentlemen, for your kindness in choosing me as chairman for this International Red Cross Conference. Je suis la fin des hostilités. Tous ceux qui ont eu l'honneur de travailler sous le drapeau de la Croix-Rouge, attendez. May I say first that I hope this will not be that sort of conference where because we participate in it, we do not fully appreciate its significance. Tager Lander, Swedish Prime Minister, made the last speech. Don't hesitate to contact the information office. It's here to help you. Could be seen in the program. And Miss Leadberry is apparently a very busy person. Here she is occupied in finding places for the delegates on a plan of room 200. Where well, the first session is just about to begin. Prince de Merod, President of the Belgian Red Cross, has a chat with Count Bernadotte and Mr. Beer. In the foreground, the interpreters greet each other. La séance est ouverte. The session is open. Sir John Newman Morris, Morris is chairman of the Aus National the Council and National Martin Executive Martin of the Australian Martin Red Martin Cross Martin and an important and active speaker. The interpreter gets to work and other speakers follow and here the delegate from Brazil, Mr. Sloper, addresses the chair. After a short speech, Mr. Pesmazoglu, the Greek delegate, approaches the chair with the gift of his country, the head of the goddess of wisdom. With this, the session closes, but the discussions continue in small groups. Here Dr. Rathby from Canada and Mr. White from New Zealand. The Minister of Brazil, Mr. Monteiro. Ms. Quintatin from Burma is leaving. And so is Norwegian Delegate General Aurelius. Here comes Mr. O'Connor and Mr. Salvador from France, President Tarham, and Lord Woolton, accompanied by Miss Warner. From the left, Mr. Gronsard, Prince de Mirod, Mr. Trishis, Ambassador Auriti, and Mr. Minucci from Italy. Mr. Gower, and Dr. Rauti again, here Mrs. Kresik and Miss Beckinsale from Australia, 
accompanied by Mr. White from New Zealand, Dr. Sewells from Venezuela, and Madame Kitane from Lebanon. And here is a straggler who must get home before the others to be their host at a cocktail party. And what a delightful party it is. Lord Woolton, Mr. O'Connor, Dr. Dobenton from Holland, and Madame Marianne, Dr. Butro from the Soviet Union, Professor Pashkov, speaking with Mr. de Rouget. Bertil seems to enjoy the sweets. And so does the other guest. Countess Banarat, the Singh Puri from India, colorful Mrs. Clubbala from India, Mr. Kudo and Mr. Shimatsu from Japan, General Paul, and Madame Georgia from Ecuador. The visit to the National Museum provided a pleasant conclusion to the evening. The museum offered a rare display of art treasures from Vienna. Mr. Rickard, who took the initiative to the exhibition, acts as a guide. And here he finds an understanding admirer of Rembrandt in Dr. Lang Golan. Serna and General Feinberg before Velasquez. Tizian, of course, cannot be compared with these watercolors, but nevertheless they show evidence of enthusiasm. They are painted by young members of the Red Cross from the whole world. Easter in Sweden, Midsummer's Day, and the Feast of Santa Lucia. These pictures show the genuine spirit of France. Here the children have preferred to use their special material. One idea, and a great one of the Union Red Cross, is to bring the youth of all nations closer together. This display can provide a pleasant interlude for the delegates between the session work. Dr. Minucci, chairman of the Junior Red Cross Commission, is just speaking about the great importance of the exchange of members of the Junior Red Cross sections with the purpose of promoting better understanding between all people in the interest of peace. Ms. Brown, the director of the Junior Red Cross of Canada the makes a proposition. The In the national costumes of the country, the Swedish Junior Red Cross has invited to coffee and buns. Thank you. 
the guests listen with enjoyment to Swedish and foreign songs. The afternoon passes rapidly and pleasantly. Finally, everyone present signs the guest book. So we come to the first Sunday, which begins with the divine service. Dean Nistet of the Stockholm Cathedral conducts the service in French, English and Swedish. And now is the time to walk down to observe two exercises arranged by the Stockholm Red Cross. On the way we have a glance at an ordinary car converted to contain a stretcher. We let these pictures speak for themselves. General Testrup are observing the next event, showing the Red Cross first aid stations in wartime. Interesting demonstration, thinks Commodore Hammerich, the president of the Danish Red Cross. The stretcher construction seems to interest the representatives of Mexico. A new week begins busily. Today, Lord Woolton has given the chair of the General Commission to Sir John Newman Morris. Besides the delegates, many observers are present. Among them we see the representatives of Israel. Here are treated such questions as the reorganization of the International Red Cross and the very difficult problem of financing of the head bodies. Flugi van Aspermont, a Dutch representative, has asked for the floor to make some remarks in the discussion about cooperation between Red Cross societies. Opposite room 200, the Legal Commission carries on its work. Here we have the chairman, Mr. Sandstrom. Ambassador Auriti is just addressing the chair. It's all about the question of the revision of the old Geneva Conventions and the discussion of the revolutionary new Convention on Protection of Civilians. Mr. White follows and touches the treatment of medical personnel. Nearly every day, three or four commissions meet not to speak of sub-commission meetings. Ms. Hensch is the secretary in this commission and also director of the League's Nursing Bureau. On the agenda of this commission are training of nurses, the blood donor program and the Red Cross social assistance.
President Talan of Turkey is the chairman of the Relief Commission. Thanks to the Red Cross, an enormous aid to countries ravaged by war has been realized in a successful way. A forceful appeal was launched by Count Bernadotte for relief to refugees from Palestine, which was seconded by President Tarhan. Every word spoken has not only to be translated into several languages. Unusual words have to be searched in dictionaries before the translation can be typed. Checked by two expert translators from Paris. Tensiled and duplicated. Sorted. And bound together. Finally, they reach the documentation where Monsieur de Toir gives a final touch. Nimble fingers are employed in sorting whole day long. And deep in the night we find the translators still at work. She certainly needs her sleep, but there is a brutal colleague. On the next day's meetings, the results of the night's long labors lie ready for the delegates. Altogether, 700,000 sheets of paper were used, enough to make a pile twice as high as the Parliament building. The plenary meetings were held in the traditional room of the Swedish Parliament's second chamber, the Assembly. Extra chairs have been put in to give room to all Red Cross and government delegates, many more than the Swedish Assembly's 230 seats. Foreign and Swedish observers, more than 100, were housed in the galleries. Delegates from all parts of the world were there. New members in the Red Cross family got a hearty welcome, among them the Philippines, Pakistan and Monaco. Ambassador François Ponce presents a proposition for a new international Red Cross. Well known by all of the British Red Cross, Miss Warner. Colonel Frost of the Canadian Red Cross speaks to his colleague Dr. Routley, Chairman of the Health Commission and Chief Canadian Delegate. He takes a very active part in many debates. The Brazilian Red Cross representatives contributed much to the conference. Their spokesmen were Dr. Vivaldo Lima Palma Pio and Mr. Sloper. Dr. Palma Lima addresses the conference. The only woman representative of the International Committee in Geneva, Mademoiselle Audier, speaks, and the observers listen attentively. The meeting is over, but the discussion continues in small groups. Opinions are exchanged about the various questions which have been treated during the meeting. until all delegates leave for lunch. More informal conversation is taking place all around. Dr. Butto from Haiti and Mrs. Steinbeck of the Swedish Red Cross Central Committee are having a friendly chat. This is not exactly Australia House, but it serves the same purpose. A Swedish guide assists. Relaxing from the exhausting tasks of the interpreters ponder over complicated chess problems, but soon they are hard at work preparing for the next meeting. Countess Waldersee, the observer from Germany, takes a nip of fresh air after a meeting. The ladies of the conference leave for a sightseeing trip on the waterways of Stockholm.
And so the day arrives for a reception at the royal palace. Crown Prince and Crown Princess arrive to receive the guests. The endless tables were festively adorned and offered many different specialties. The atmosphere was congenial. Count Bernadotte holds an important conference every morning at 9 o'clock before the meetings begin. The restricted bureau is the steering committee of the conference. The commission's chairman and the secretariat general take part. Here the composition of the new permanent commission of the International Red Cross was discussed before the final election. Lord Woolton looks doubtful, but was elected himself. There is no rest for Count Bernadotte. Between conferences, he has to find time for broadcasts. Shortwave listeners all over the world eagerly await news from the conference. This is Stockholm. In collaboration with the Swedish radio service, the Swiss National Radio Corporation brings you a brief report on the 17th International Red Cross Conference, now in session. This is the first time an international Red Cross conference is held since the Second World War, which in such a devastating manner ravaged both countries and people. The French film company, which has produced the film of Henri Dunant's life, visits the Parliament. The world premiere takes place during the conference. The well-known Swedish actor Lauritz Falk is their guide. The film is directed by Christian Jacques, who is accompanied by his charming wife. And so, the second and last Sunday has come. Lots of buses drive up to Parliament, but there is no danger that they won't be fully occupied. The Russian observers Dr. Butrov and Professor Peshkov will miss their places if they don't hurry. And so, off they go to Uppsala, the old university town north of Stockholm. Here they arrive. The Red Cross flag, flattering in the wind, welcomes them. Under these low hills lay ancient warrior kings, as Professor Neerman explains, surrounded by listening delegates. It's a beautiful sunny day. And after having climbed the hills, a fresh drink of genuine Viking beer is welcomed by all. Skål, says Dr. Buto. It's not so easy to drink out of a horn, especially if you are not used to. 
the Palastira wants to have a memory. Many of the companies take part in the divine service in the ancient church. Even an old farming settlement seems to attract the interest of money. And so the buses return home after an interesting day which culminated in a luncheon at 16th century Uppsala Castle. From now on reigns an atmosphere of imminent departure. So far it has been fairly quiet in the travel bureau, but now orders come for both air and train tickets. It is pleasant to take home a book of pictures in memory of Sweden. Addresses are exchanged by Mr. Shankar Nigam from India who wants to correspond with a lady from the Swedish Junior Red Cross. But delegates meets once more at the concluding performance at the Royal Opera, where La Bohème is presented with famous tenor Jussi Björli. In this, the era of black crosses, let us raise aloft the shining token of our sacred mission, the Red Cross. Behold the Red Cross, gleaming like a leading light, with arms extended, clear as rubies, as through clouds of smoking ruins, mercy like a pilgrim goes her way. Shining in tent by bed of pain, warmth bringing in the frosty night, for at her kindly heart shall be rekindled the tired flame of life about to fade. Where this is raised shall mercy reign in battle, as when at God's command in ancient Egypt the angel of the scourge passed by in mercy each dwelling marked with blood of Easter land. Close on the heels of conflict shall it follow, proclaiming to the searing flood of hate, the day will come when thy proud surge is stilled, for deeper is the fount of love, and life shall ever over death prevail. <laughs> 